Welcome to the RSP Film Room, Mark Schofield, Matt Waldman. We're going to cover Carson Strong today. Carson, should, Carson Strong is an intriguing quarterback. Um, Mark got a chance to talk to him up close at the Combine, and I've been looking forward to this because I think talent-wise on the film, I think he's one of the best quarterbacks in this class. Um, you know, But there are some things involved with that that may not make him the guy that you want to put at the top of your board right now, Mark. Yeah. I mean, what, what's interesting with Strawn, a lot of it is the medical history and he, you know, he took that head on when he talked to us at the combine and basically said, look, you know, my doctors told me not to play last year. My dad told me not to play last year. Um, but I said, absolutely not. We have to find a way to play because I'm not going to leave my teammates in the lurch. I'm not going to leave those guys behind. Like I've grown with these guys. I've grown with Romeo dubs. I've grown with my, my teammates and I'm not going to leave them in the lurch. So we got to come up with a plan. And so they came up with this sort of six month condensed timeline where he could play and they had to make some decisions. Like he had to sit out practices. He had to rely on like a golf cart at times to get around, but he wanted to play, you know? And I think that sort of, checks that leadership box. And what's also interesting in talking to him, he had complete autonomy at the line of scrimmage. Like he, he was telling us, look, I get up to the line of scrimmage and I see something I could check into runs. I could check into the deep ball. I can check into quick game. Like I could get into and out of anything at the line of scrimmage. Like I had complete and utter control at the line of scrimmage, which you don't get a lot from other college quarterbacks. And so I think that's impressive. He also talked about, and I've got an example of this, the knee injury led to him compensating with his body and throwing mechanics and his lower body mechanics. And it's now something he's having to sort of rework through with Jordan Palmer. And as such, the guy we saw on film last year wasn't, as we expected, the full Carson Strong experience. And so I think there's a ton of upside. And as he said, look, there's a ton of untapped potential here with my with my arm, with my velocity, with my arm talent, because – I didn't have it. I didn't have the ability to drive through throws last year. And once that's back, watch out. And so I think he's a very impressive prospect too, for a lot of different reasons, but that medical history is, is going to be something the teams will be worried about. Yeah. Do you think it's a necessarily a disqualifier for him based on what I've seen with the knee surgery? He's had a pair and one of and it was the second one was basically due to a genetic condition where they had to grab like it was like a bone basically or a, wasn't like a bone growth type of thing that they had to deal with and as a result of that the prognosis is positive for these types of procedures it's right. just that it takes a while to heal and he decided to to not just check the leadership box but probably just um, drop the mic on it um by the fact that he played through this yeah i mean I, I think that's right i mean i i think you know he and matt corral really checked that sort of leadership you know command a locker room type box at the combine during their podium sessions and i think the idea that you know he looked at his injury history and said you know what i'm still gonna play that speaks volumes to me like that like that's going to command a locker room that's going to command a huddle um you know and if you then see him improve on velocity and arm talent and refine the lower body mechanics. That's going to be pretty impressive. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and the fact that he's someone that, you know, is wants to put his teammates in front of other, you know, in front of himself like that, it, you know, whether you question the, you know, the wisdom of it or not, the fact right. that he knows that you're not guaranteed forever. Yep. And he wanted a chance to to really help his teammates. It it does say a lot. Yeah. Um and, and before we get started today, you know, there's something that I do want to uh, talk about um that's kind of on a related note with that. Um we have a we have an RSP subscriber by the name of John Hodgins, who's also a football guy subscriber, and and I've you know, I've been back and forth with John over the years, as with many readers that I've had who've asked questions about fantasy. And John's 75 years old. He worked um, at Modesto Hospital for over 20 years, um, you know, and he 
he ran into some, you know, he ran into some issues and, and contacted me about this around the Super Bowl. And, and I want to direct people to his GoFundMe page. Um, he's trying to raise about $7,500 for he and his family. And, and I'll give you the, the long of the short of it is that, you know, John, John prepared for retirement with his family and he had gotten a really nice house to rent up in Sierra, in the Sierra mountains and, um, thought he was going to be able to kind of live out his days with his family there. And he was a victim of essentially a home invasion, um, where and a, where a gunman assaulted him and his family and while the gunman serving 22 years in prison for for the offense um as many of you probably or hope hopefully many of you aren't aware but some of you probably unfortunately are is that when something like this happens maybe you get justice from the legal system from the standpoint that the person who commits the crime goes to jail but the upheaval that um, a gunman coming into your house, not only the psychological and physical damage they can do, he had his skull cracked by the gunman, um, but also, you know, the trauma that he and, and his, and his, you know, the lady in his life have um, undergone, not only to the event, but also the fact that they were renting and the, when the gunman shot off his gun and, in the house and did the damage that he did to the house, the renter decided to, the, the tent, the landlord decided to sell the house and, and tell them to leave. And so when you're on a fixed income and you kind of set up where you're going to be, and then this upheaval happens suddenly, you know, John, John spent, you know, you know, some years trying to uh, remedy that, but being 75, already retired, trying to find work, and then also dealing with some illnesses on his own that include some kidney disease. Um, he's had trouble finding work. And so he and his family have had to move around the country some to just find places to live, which included living in, you know, cheap, cheap motels, living out of their car at times, living in the homeless shelters at times. Um, the types of things that someone would do when they're trying to make things work without asking for help. And when the only family that you have is, you know, is an adult age daughter who's struggling with mental illness, who you need to be helping and want to be trying to help, but you're dealing with trauma on your own. It's a confluence of events that, you know, has made it difficult for John and his family. And right now he's living in a, in a trailer um, up in Oregon, um, you know, and I just thought, I think of like my father, who's about John's age. I think about, um, people who were father figures to me who are about John's age right now. And I think about the event, how one event can totally upturn your life in a way like this. Um, so I've donated to his GoFundMe. I'm going to have a link here at the, on the YouTube page for it, as well as on my site. Um, John's trying to raise the money so that he can find, you know, be able to have a stable place for he and his wife to live, for him to be able to be closer to his daughter, um, who had been homeless for a time as well and trying to help stabilize her situation. And so that they can have that stability so that he can also, you know, address some of the health issues that he's dealing with as well. I'm sure that the stress of all this, you know, even just writing him back and forth and, you know, looking at some of the things that he talked about, you know, fact that he's, you know, they can compound, you know, the, the, the type of stress that I can only imagine going through living out of your car, living out of a, out of a dilapidated trailer and right. having to move around the country after all this, when you thought that you had built up what you, and had your plan and had a good plan and for something like this to turn it upside down at that age has got to be an unbelievable amount of stress and i just thought you know if if we if we can it you know if you you know with the number of listeners that we have with this you know if each of you if if each of you listening on average donated say seven or eight dollars you know a cup of coffee and a and a, and a, you know, a muffin in the morning, you, 
he would he would be at or exceed the goal of what he was looking for just to be able to get him he, him and his family in a stable situation and then being able to then go from there. Um, so, and, and sometimes with these things, even if you can't donate that, share it. Like, yeah. you know, share out on whether it's Facebook or Twitter or, you know, e even in a, a family group chat or something like share it out so other people can take a look at it because, you know, sometimes that's worth as much, if not more than, you know, one individual donation, but it's, it's a tremendous thing that you're doing here, Matt. And, you know, if people could help out, it would be great for, for, for his family. It would. And, you know, again, you know, this is a man who obviously, you know, worked all his life, you know, was, has been taking care of other people and tried the best that he could until he kind of ran out of options to where it just, you know, and I've seen situations like this and where folks, you know, things, something turns your life upside down and you just, you know, your first response is to try and take care of yourself and you may not have any other options, but for you to take care of right. yourself and with being with the, with having kidney disease and, and at the age that he is, it is hard to find work and to find the kind of work where you can support yourself and get the kind of care that you need. Um, it's difficult. You, you know, I certainly know that, you know, if, try, you know, there's some places people say, well, well, try working here or try doing this. And I can I can tell you that certain jobs require a certain level of commitment that um, that pay less and require more commitment than certain corporate jobs <laughs> where they give you the flexibility to do things and make a lot more money, um, you know, which can make it doubly frustrating. So, you know, especially and then also. There is age discrimination in terms of hiring practices. It's not right. talked about a lot, but it's, you know, so when you have someone, you know, who's 75 and has some illnesses, that that's a difficult scenario. So I would just say, you know, if you can think about your, you know, think about someone in your family who, you know, whether it's a father or an uncle um, or a grandfather in your life and imagine something like that, you know, hopefully it never happens, but just imagine their life being turned upside down, especially when they plan to live on a certain fixed income and, right. and, and that goes away. And, you know, it's hard to make them, you know, fix things quickly when what was supposed to be the bedrock and stability of your situation is basically taken out from underneath of you. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put this up here and I'll, and I'll tweet it out as well today and, and probably mention this one another time on the podcast. So we're rooting for John and, you know, obviously I've donated, hopefully you will do the same. So Carson strong, let's get to watching some Carson strong tape here. And Mark, I know you've, you know, we thought beforehand that this was a guy that could possibly be QB one. Um, you know, obviously what you talked about earlier with the medicals and the mechanics, you know, may not be, but could eventually that looked pretty nice. I'll say that. Yeah. And, and what I love about this first play here is in this game against Kansas state, you're going to see him working through some drop eight stuff, working through some, you know, pre-snap versus post-snap reads. And here he's going to have to navigate this weak side defensive end drop that edge Defender is going to drop off. They're going to rotate this into a zone look and just rush three. And he's still able to read it out and make it throw into a window with anticipation. And I know it's just like, you know, five-step glance route, throwing weak side, but he's got to figure it out. You know, he's going to solve that puzzle, you know, pre-snap here. You're thinking maybe it's man. Now it's dropping into zone and he's going to hit that window between that curl flat defender and that underneath hook defender. And he does it. Yeah, I just really like this play. And what's interesting about the combine is, you know, he talked about this a little bit. Matt Corral talked about it a little bit when they're meeting with teams, NFL teams are asking them, how do you deal with drop eight? And I think that's a sign that even teams that might not draft these guys know the next sort of defensive wave might be this drop eight stuff, because this year and the past couple of years, it's been, how do you deal with too high? Then we see the Bengals and what they did against Kansas City would drop eight, that might be the next little thing that defenses are doing that offenses have to figure out. And that's why teams are asking these kids about it. Here you see him navigate it really well. 
Yeah, the placement's great. And I'll tell you what you do with drop eight. You give the ball to Zamir White. That's what you yeah. do. But yeah. anyway, yeah, the placement here is fantastic. You know, right? You know, to me, that's the that's like the finishing touch of all this. The diagnostic stuff is is obviously the the cake here, but the icing on it is after all of that processing, he can quickly say, "I know where this ball needs to go" because I have to anticipate that underneath linebacker. Yeah. Yeah, and that that's a really good aspect to this throw, too. People might say, well, it's off target. It's behind him. But now look at it from his point of view. You've got that hook curl, hook to curl guide coming from inside out. You lead him a bit, he's going to get under that throw. So you kind of have to sort of put it behind him a bit. And this also gives us our first look at his mechanics. You see him, it's a short throw, but he's not really driving off that back leg with the, the knee injury. You see the big brace there. Yeah, if he's... it's all cleaned up and he figures it out, those throws are going to have more pop to him. Yeah, I mean, he's dragging that leg behind yeah. him. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's that's kind of like, it's probably one, and the guy I would compare him to early on, stylistically, is Phillip Rivers right now. Right. And when you look at, and you know, this is kind of one step above Phillip Rivers playing in, against the Patriots with a torn ACL. He's better yeah. than that because, you know, but it's, but it's not far away from that either when you talk about, you know, his mobility and what he can do. You know, and this is obviously another soft co coverage drop three, but here a little bit of pocket movement has to slide a little bit. And then to fit this throw in. Yeah. Like, it's just absurd. Yeah. yeah. And the anticip. see what I love about that movement in the pocket is that he feels the push. Yeah. But he doesn't overreact to it. He can't no. overreact to it, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, you could even joke that nature or nurture is that, you know, the 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 environment he's in, if he's going to play, he's going to only be able to move the way he moves because he's not he he's not mobile um, at this stage of his career. But the fact that he does it so calmly shows you that even beforehand, this was a part of his game. Yeah. And the end zone angle of this throw is is just absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, you see where he has to put this. I mean, he's even got the uh, the official underneath to work this throw around. Yeah. And he knows. Because, like, watch him point that front toe right here. Yeah. He's turning his chest and everything to that spot where he's throwing. So he knows where that ball's got to be placed. Yeah. And he's getting ready right there. That's fantastic. Yeah, and you see, like, again, this is all upper body torque. This is all, like, I've got to drive this in here, so I'm going to crank this up. You see him whip around. Now if he has that right leg under him. Yeah, yeah. That's an, I, I think I have this throw as well on yeah. my tape. I, I, mean, I, I think anybody who would do a film room on him would put this throw on. Yeah, there. I mean, when he gets drafted, that throw is going to be on there. Yeah, That throw is going to be part of the little highlight package here. Trying to remember what play this is. I oh, I remember. I know. That. Yep. Yeah. And, and just a, a great read of this, right? Yeah. You know, yeah, you've got the mesh underneath, but he knows it's zoned, so you got to work the compensate over the top of it. And he's able to rip this. That safety, reading his eyes, can't get there in time because of the velocity he's able to put on it. Yeah. Velocity working off of one leg. Yeah. Yeah. Just an, another impressive throw. Yeah. If you're, to, see, to me, when I watch stuff like this and I go, you're measuring talent, not draft stock. Yeah. I don't know how you don't have him in your top two to three. If you're right. measuring from the uh, draft ability, can he play for you right away? The answer is, mm, yeah, he could, but maybe you have some other guys that you can give you that immediacy. And if you want a more mobile guy, anyhow, right. You, you, you know, you're going to want to give Carson strong a year, probably to fully yep. heal up. That's the deal. I mean, here's your, your sort of box check throw, right? Left yeah. hash, right sideline on the deep comeback, but on time in rhythm, perfect placement, you know, your NFL kind of throw and here he checks that box. Yeah. And this is a guy that even without being able to rip it the way he says he can, 
can throw the ball 60 yards opposite hash with pinpoint accuracy. Yeah. The, I don't think there's another quarterback in this draft who actually can do those two things as consistently as Carson Strong. Malik right. There Willis are other guys in this class yeah. that can do it. It's just the question of consistency. Yeah. And, you know, here, like his eyes, right? Yeah. Knows what he's got, comes right to it, you know, confident decision. You know, it's not a situation where he has to see it to throw it. He knows exactly where to go with the football. Yep. And it's out before the break, puts it on him on time. Just just a really good throw. Very efficient. You know? Yeah. And again, here's what he talked about in, in Indy, right? Freedom at the line of scrimmage, sees something active in the pre-snap phase. So you're going to get that out of the gate. And then you get the deep ball under pressure. Yeah. You know, and that's, you know, right hash, left sideline, pocket sort of collapsing around him and just drops it in a bucket. Yeah, it's kind of like the throw Kenny Pickett wouldn't make. Right. You know, safety at the opposite side of the field, reads it one-on-one right here, even yep. leaving. Yep. Now it's a different game scenario. This isn't like late fourth quarter. Right. You know, so to be fair to Mr. Pickett, you know, but at the same time, you know, the fact that he saw it, called it, and and attacked it, that's what you want. And what I like there, you see him use the hard count and the cadence to try to get information. Now, Cal doesn't show anything, but, you know, you, you watch Aaron Rodgers do that on a week, week into week out basis. So he uses his hard count to try to get the defense to show him something. Cal doesn't show him anything here. They're pretty disciplined, but yet another thing that he has in the bag. Yeah. He here may- you go. Look, eight seconds left. Yep. You're down. Fourth quarter. Red zone. Need to rip a throw. You see the two high look pre-snap. They're in it. Little pocket movement and hit that post. And he knows. I mean, like, right here, he knows where he's going. And it's just like, let me buy some room and enough time. Yep. And that safety's moving away to the outside. That little movement to the outside, intentionally or not, manipulates the safety further to the yep. boundary, and then he throws it back inside. And I think we'll see that a little bit more with the with the red zone view here. Yeah. You know, just a, another example of, okay, he knows pre-snap, they're in too high, they're sticking in it, I know where I have to go, but I got to make this a cleaner throw. So it's it's not wild, violent pocket movement, it's a bit subtle. You know, and it's sort of an off-platform throw, but there's enough arm talent to put it on the receiver and you get the touchdown. Yeah. And it's, you know, I'm laughing because I actually think, from what I've seen before the injury, I'm sure that his, I mean, he had good pocket movement before the injury, but I think this this injury may actually reinforce him reinforce the things that the top quarterbacks really need to have to operate from a pocket. Yeah. Look Climb, at that. fire, under pressure, and just let this go. Yeah. Like... <clears throat> yeah. And again, doctor said, please don't play this year. Yeah. Dad said, please don't play this year. Like that's just another ridiculous throw. Um, and to do that, move it in the pocket with his injury, with the pocket collapsing around him. And that's something that translates to the next level. You know, you see that rush of pressure off the edge and he doesn't panic. You know, that's something we talked about with Kenny Pickett, right? When you get that sort of unexpected pressure, how he responds to it. Here it's just, oh, I've got edge pressure. I'm going to climb, reset, let this go. And it's perfect. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Just a, that's, this guy's a ballsy player, man. And now we're in overtime now. Use the cadence. See if they show anything. Okay. Now we're going to adjust at the line of scrimmage. Get nobody deep, right? Cover zero look. Rep the post route. Yep. Little inside, but he's probably accounting for the dropping 
defender there too yeah. a little bit. Yeah, a little inside, but he, you know he puts it on the frame. Yeah, you know not. Sometimes you don't try to make the perfect throw. You just try to make the good throw. That's right. You know, and you, you try to make the perfect throw here. Maybe you lead him a step too far. You see the eyes. He confirms it and just drills this in there. Yep. I, I th- okay, yeah, this is, you know, you include one bad play, right? <laughs> and, and maybe this is more a great play by this safety who starts left hash, gets to the middle of the field. But it doesn't really move him. Can't really yeah. step into it, and you get the pick. Yeah, and I think there's a couple of plays where you watch him. This isn't one of those for me. That I remember this one, and it is he just not totally underestimated the range of the safety. Yeah. yeah, I mean Peyton Manning used to do that with Ed Reed. What do you expect? Right. You know, I mean sometimes that happens. And and to me. It's plays plays like this when I watch them and I'm evaluating the guy. If it happens all the time, that's one thing. But if I see once in a while this type of thing, I'm just like, whatever. He just didn't think this guy could cover that kind of ground. And yeah, I mean, okay. I, I think that's it more than anything. Um, but I mean, again, it, I think if he had more under him in terms of his legs, I, I think he'd probably be in a good position to hit that throw. Absolutely. So let's see how much overlap we have here. <laughs> I think we're going to have a fair amount because I always included this play too. Yeah. And and this was a fun one just because even, you know, even basically with his opportunity to, to you know, imitate a pirate on the helm of the ship here with his peg leg and the parrot on his shoulder, yeah. you know, the fact that he can throw a little bit on the move, he can layer this between the high low of the yep. defender peeling off and put it where it needs to be. I mean, there are quarterbacks who can't do this with two good legs. Right. I mean, you could tell he's labor in there. I mean. Yeah. I think this looks familiar. Yeah, I think it does too. There's that There's that play that you just And highlighted. again, Matt and I do not, as you can tell, since we have overlap plays, like we don't coordinate on this. No, It's, it's, a... it's just a, a indication that we're seeing some of the same things when we pick some of the same plays. Yeah. But I, yeah, I see this is, it's tough for me because when you know that when you, you know, if you're a team, obviously he's not going to be atop your board. So, you know, I talked to somebody and he may be listening. He may not. You can see basically, I just showed you, you know, the limited mobility that he has, but also, you know, where he can throw people open, you know, I like this play for that as well but you know there's someone that i talked to who's at the combine and i mentioned that carson strong's at or close to the top on my board and his response was kind of like no no matt no no you know but from his point of view he covers the draft right as much as he covers talent you know so he he's always thinking about mock drafts and right. the board and what teams are going to do and that he's covering what a team would do. I could give two shits about what a team will do. You know, right. I'm, I care. My whole thing is about who's the most talented player. And when I think about who's the most talented player, he may not be at the very top unequivocally, but if someone said to me, he's my best player, I'd say, I have no argument with you. Yeah. You know, and I I think that's part of what we're going to see with this class is that there's going to be a a wide range of responses when you ask somebody who their top five QBs are. And people are going to be sort of all over the place. And, you know, the talent is there. It's just from a draft perspective, like from the perspective of the person you were just talking about, teams might not make that early investment because they're worried about the knee. They're worried about longevity. They're worried about other things. Yeah. But from a pure talent standpoint, it's there. Yeah. And this is just another example of a throw where you've got to put it, you know, away from the coverage. It doesn't work yep. out, but the idea makes sense. And I, I like the thought process because, you know, you see him open right. You're trying to get that mic to move. He doesn't move. So now you got to fix it with the throw. Yeah. And I think that, you know, when I see this, see the mental part of the game is probably the one of the most influential things for me. Like for me, I... I draft this guy all day, every day. 
And, and if you look at that end zone angle again, I love how he tries to use the shoulders to sell it. He doesn't flash ball, but you see him sort of jerk that right shoulder back. Like yeah. Right there. Yeah. Like he's, I'm throwing it. Now the mics either misses it or doesn't read it, or he's really disciplined in his drop. But then, yeah, he tries to fix it sort of post snap with the throw and just doesn't quite connect. That's a good catch of that. And then there's another one throwing yeah. open layered throw. And, and this is another throw I almost had in there. Yeah, this is the Cole Turner special right here. Yeah. All right, let's look at it one more time here. Yeah. And they like that route too, where you've got, you know, it looks like you're running the over the, the shallow and then you break up to split the safeties. It's probably what's gonna get Cole Turner drafted. Yeah. Makes the adjustment for the... Yep. You know, and again, you've got the two safeties to navigate. That's why he puts it there. Yeah. One more time. For the cheap seats. Yep. Nice little look to the left. Yep. Pressure up the middle. And this is the thing that just blew me away about Carson Strong. Yeah. Is that playing on one leg and just the efficiency of his movement. Okay, let's let's see if we can get this a little bit further up because the efficiency of his movement on this particular play, you know. Just right here, he's got two yep. points of pressure, spins away, and then the off-platform throw, kind of like a little hook shot. Yep. Looks like something Chris Mullen would have done. I was watching right. some Chris Mullen highlights, you know, kind yeah. of the runner in the lane, you know. And while it's not a perfect throw, the fact that he's even, like, in the range here. The fact that he was able to be in a position to even try that throw. Yeah given the two points of pressure and of course the fact he's doing it on one leg. Yeah. That, you know, to me, this just highlights the awareness. Yeah. And he puts it where it needs to be. Yeah. Yeah. It may lead him into some contact, but that need to be caught. Yeah. Just another nice job, you know, back shoulder under pressure, you know, yep. in, you know, in a tight window. He does this all day long. He can pick apart a defense. That's, he can. You know. you know. He can. And, you know, again, it gets us to that, you know, he's – you're worried about drop eight. He's seen it. You know, yep. here's obviously a four-man rush, but he can find throwing lanes. And more importantly, he can navigate leverage. And that's something that we've talked about over the past couple of years, right? Yep. Like, you need two things, I think – to be successful early. Oh, hey, I recognize that one. Yep. <laughs> um, yep. You need to be able to recognize leverage and throw against it, and you need to be mobile. You need to be some sort of pocket mobility. And yep. while maybe that pocket mobility is is a bit more of a work in progress, he has the leverage box checked. Oh, yeah. And, that, and to me, that's the thing. Like, to me, the mobility is important for him to play right away right now. But the pocket awareness is among the best in this class. Yeah. You know, like just the feel when to move, how to move, the timing that he needs to get the ball out, like this right here. Yeah. I mean, he can be creative. He, you know, this is what got, this is what kept Phillip Rivers in the league as long as he was. Interior pressure, just being able to know how to time it. Yeah, it was a screenplay, but even the play where he spun around and yeah. made the little runner in the lane, you know, out in the flat there, that's, those are the type of plays that more mobile guys, Kyler Murray has trouble doing stuff like this. Right. And Kyler Murray is one of the most, one of the two to three most mobile quarterbacks in the NFL. And he, he's, he doesn't have the calm of body movement and efficiency of body movement that Carson Strong does. Can you run that back to the sideline start? Yeah. Because I think there's also something interesting here. This one? 
Yeah. Okay. A little rotation here. Yeah, and like I think even if you go back before that, I think he knows that slot blitz is coming. Okay, let's see if we can get to that. Yeah, start here. Yeah, he's pointing it out. Yeah. He's pointing out right there. Yep. I mean, it, it's right, because you've got that cap safety coming. Like, he knows it. And it's kind of, and he does a nice job with the little look off there, too, because yeah. he looks downfield and then gives a little bit of a three-quarter throw to the right. But, yeah, he knows that that's coming. So you see his eyes yeah. go right there? Yep. They know exactly what's coming on this, and they're ready for it. Now he still gets – what's even better is the pressure comes from the inside. Yeah. It's not the blitzer that pressures him. It's the inside defender. So he has to – he has the pre-snap expectation that slot blitz is coming, but then you get that unexpected flash of pressure, and it doesn't phase him. That's a little different than Pickett, right? Yep. The, the conversation we had with Pickett was if he knows the pressure is coming, he's okay, but if it's unexpected – that's where it's a bit shaky. So if Pickett's here on this play, yeah, if it's the edge pressure, he's going to be okay. But when you get that different point of pressure from the inside that you might not be expecting, yep, he's still able to navigate it. Yep, that's this stands him above guys like Bailey Zapp and Kenny Pickett. And Bailey Zapp's a fun quarterback as well to watch. But yeah. but you know, yeah, that's that's where part of the difference is. That's a great point, Mark. All right, so moving forward, I think this play. Okay, this is one where I think I wanted to show, you know, where he may underestimate off coverage a little bit. Yeah. And under pressure here, he just. Yeah, he underestimates the ancillary coverage. This is one of the yeah. things that he had difficulty with them. The greatest difficulty he had diagnostically as a coverage reader is when it's not the defenders who are covering the receiver. It's the defender yeah, it's who's help. in the secondary help. He has the issues with that. And he just misses this guy coming downhill here to cut that off. Yeah, and I, I think that's also a good job by that safety to sort of slow play the rotation there because they're spinning it to single high. You know, he comes down like right after the snap, and I think he just didn't see the rotation. I think that's that makes sense because he's looking, he looks left, comes back. And that to safety his right. is still kind of in the hash. They're like really rotating this late. Yes. That's nasty. Yeah, yeah. And he can't, and he gives that little feint inside. So yeah. the fact that he's facing his chest to the inside, right here, and he's facing inside like that, the leverage says I'm inside. I'm yeah. covering Cole Turner. Yeah. And so when the decision's made, he makes that quick turn. So that makes sense. That's a nice play by Cal. It really like was. It. All right, pressure up the middle. And only where oh. he... Yeah, I loved yeah. this play. Because it was just, yeah. again, under pressure, interior pressure, and he has basically a honey hole to put this in, essentially. Yep. The the shallow defender peels off the, the man just outside the hash to the outside man, and he anticipates that and puts that thing high. Yeah, that's silly. Opposite field, too. Yep. Listen, with the way there's no guarantees with quarterbacks, I'll wait. Yeah. I'll wait on him. Yeah. I will wait on him. I do have a landing spot in mind for him. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if maybe this is the year I'm finally right about it. It's what been is... one we've been clamoring for for years. Yeah. Let's hear Tampa it. Bay, Bruce Arians. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I and mean, that's they perfect. Can, it'll give him a chance to redshirt him for a year and, 
you know, they can give Kyle Trask and Blaine Gabbert the shot. And if it doesn't pan out, now you've got him with a year of rest, rehab, and an NFL strength and conditioning program. Yeah. And, you know, he's the type of guy, I bet, who can learn from the mistakes of Blaine Gabbert. You know, Blaine Gabbert would be the type of guy that would be a good teacher for Carson Strong. Because Carson Strong would, I think, would have a good, based on what he does right now, would have a good filter of, what to what to get that's a value from Blaine Gabbert and then right. what also to ignore if there is anything right. to ignore. You know, like I think he'd have that good judge of of perspective with that. But like let's take a look at this play one more time here. Again, that was that play that you showed earlier. Yep. Yep. And, and then let's see what else we had here. Just another nice attack deep. This time he does beat the safety. Yep. Which was earlier in the game, I believe, why he was, you know, probably got complete. Thought the other guy was going to be able to make it, but again, layered throw. Layered throw. Really nice ball. I mean, maybe it's a little bit far outside, but like you see him attack in the middle of the field a lot more than some of these other guys. Yeah, and the small movement away from the interior pressure here. Just that yeah. little move. But you can see with the mechanics with that lower leg. You can, yeah. you know, you don't even, we don't even have to go into it. it. It's pretty obvious that, you know, he's, he's, he's just screwed with his mechanics any way possible to get the ball where it needs to go. Yeah. Here's that pick we saw earlier. Yeah. All right, a little bit of a change here. Yep. And this was one where I remember why I did this because it, and it didn't show it the way I wish it would have, but he kind of, I thought I had the red zone view of this, but I think this is one where he drags that leg and he just can't get, yeah, he just can't get the the distance and velocity to go opposite field on this. It was yeah. inconsistent for him, and this was the opener, wasn't it? Just I believe so. Yeah, yeah. So his arm actually gets better as the weeks go on, but that was week one coming off of that. There's your opening play. <laughs> yeah, you know another one we recognize. Yep. And I'm sure we'll this. I'm sure we're about to see another couple plays here that were similar. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's there's that pinpoint throw, a good you know sixty yards down the field. Yeah, over two defenders, drop it in in a bucket. Yeah, one leg. Just, just picture Chris Godwin on the other end of this one. Yeah. Hell, Mike. Yeah. Oh, anybody. Yeah. I think that got DPI too. Yeah, it did. Nice pocket move. Oh, I love, I remember this one. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. the adjustment. Yeah. But it just doesn't work out for him on that. Yeah. Yeah. I totally get what he was thinking here with this throw. But his receiver falls down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, like, the pocket movement, the slide, the way he read that out. Uh, yeah, I really like that play in a way, even though it's a pick. Yeah. It just shows you, you know, with this particular – he wanted to put it away from the coverage that was yep. at the boundary. Yeah. And the slide was great, but his receiver just couldn't stay on his feet to do it. Yeah. But yeah, there were a lot of good things about this particular play. Again, just to be able to yep. read side to side, come back to your your outlet. Nice, nice climb. Yes. And then you just see that 
you know, he just didn't. Yeah, have he can't one. go anywhere. Yeah. yeah. But he almost got away still. Yeah. Your play again? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Knew he was going to see that one again. Yeah. Hockey, you not. And you just see consistently, we've shown up at least four plays where he slides to one side of the field. Nice pump fake yep. climb back down to the to the outlet. Not lost at all with that. I think I recognize this one too. Yep, I think you do. Yeah. And that's a good play too because they kind of interchange the safeties on it and he's still able to navigate it. Yeah. Once again, just, you know. Subtle pocket movement, create a little space, slide around a bit. Yep. Manages the game. I think he manages the game very well. Yeah. And I think, I think this, I really do the more, look at that. <laughs> that was a beautiful yeah. catch. Maybe, not a, catch. maybe well, not a perfect throw, but again, throws the them open. Process, right? Yeah. And again, you oh, know, looks like did he drop it? Yeah. Bad arm, you know, bad leg, probably better leg. He rips that ball where it's not so far away. Right. You know, so you you can even you can give him a little bit of a gimme with pinpoint to general accuracy due to the leg. You know, getting it done on the move, even yeah. you know. I mean that's another tough window to hit. On the move from a static platform. I mean, Peyton Manning did this with the Broncos for about two, three years right here. Yeah. There we go. Beats the really safety nice there. Yeah. Yep. Opposite hash. And we're looking, yep. I mean, we're looking 40, 45, about 45, 50 yards right there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Boise State, for playing this game during the day and wearing Seriously. orange jerseys. Yeah, my, makes it a little bit easier. My eyes, thank you. This I loved. Yeah. Just, I mean, the number of reads that, that he had to make. Oops, we'll go back to it in a second here. But yeah, opening it up to the left, working through all the concepts, getting back to the check down. I... Yeah, here it comes. You know, look at... Trying to get that switch concept to the left. Yep. That's not there. Comes back to his right. Looks, nope. looks deep. That looks covered. little creativity. Yep. Yeah. And you don't see when he makes throws like this, they're makeable throws. Yeah. It's not like stuff that you shouldn't be trying. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the again That's tough for a guy one leg, man. Yeah, I mean, there are guys with two great legs who won't do this, who won't climb a pocket. Uh, I, I would say that Malik Willis does not climb a pocket. He runs through a pocket. Yeah, you know, but he he won't climb and sidestep like this. And, yeah, you know, this actually moves chains. Yep, as often or more than the fireworks that happens before. Caleb Ellaby should watch some Carson Strong film. I'll say yeah. that. Yeah. Just more climbing, more yeah, dead on. Finding a way to get it done. Yeah. I mean, making a throw while falling down. 
fine, we'll figure it out. <laughs> Great catch, but it Great was a catch. nice throw too. Man, I don't know what that underneath defender was thinking, trying to get under that. But... Yeah. I've got a couple more a couple more minutes left in, of tape here. And you can see, you know, Mark and I certainly saw some of the similar games yep. here. That, you know, NFL got, throw, left yep. hash, right sideline. Yep. Nice little looper where it needed to be under pressure, I felt like. Yeah. He puts it he puts it to the pylon. It's just yeah. you know, he his receiver, Cole Turner, gets pushed out of bounds and rerouted. Uh, that's what I wanted to show is like he keeps putting it where it needs to be. Yeah. Like it's like it may not be caught, but he's putting it where it needs to be, and eventually it they connect. Eventually they got it. Yeah. So, and I like the fact that he stays, you know, even when there's misses, it doesn't work. He keeps going at it. Yeah. And that's no, important he, too. He doesn't shy away from, you know, throws like that if he's missed one. Again, pretty good pocket movement there, sliding around. Yeah. Get into that route. It may not be pretty for the highlight package, but it's beautiful to me. I'm telling yeah. you. Bit of a no look to it as well. Yeah. <laughs> right over the the underneath defender. He does this. I mean, regular. We keep showing yeah. these plays. It's like. You no, know, he can layer in throws really well. Yeah. Yeah, that that's that's an impressive throw. Felix Sharp over at Campus to Canton. I feel you. Yep. You know, I've been wanting to tell you this for a long time. I feel you. I know Felix has been talking about him for a while. Yeah. I feel you. And that one hands a little bit, but yeah. still like that want to put it to the outside and get that corner concept. Yeah. That and that's one where you just you don't complete. You didn't judge the throw that you should have there. Like yeah. that's not a throw you probably make. Yeah. But there weren't a lot of those. So right. Yeah. So that's that's what we have for old Carson Strong. I gotta say, there's one other quarterback I have with a higher grade. Yep. But he's not realistically gonna get drafted in in that range. I think I know who that quarterback is. I think you do too. And I think we're yeah. going to profile him fairly soon because I'm itching to, to share um, yeah. and, and have a conversation about him. But Carson strong of the, of the quarterbacks who could get a day one or early day two pick. He's my top graded guy. Now I understand again, draft wise, he's not going to be the top graded guy. If you want yeah. immediate impact starter, He's the least likely of the big four or five right. to have that. But if you want the most impactful player, he could be in the argument. Uh, he is in the argument to be that guy. And he could land in the best situation of them all in the same way that we go, well, Aaron Rodgers, they need to rework his mechanics. And maybe he's he's a little arrogant and maybe we got to worry about some of that with his, you know, with his game or... Lamar Jackson, you know, you know, he didn't play in a pro system. Yes, he did. Yes, He's, he did. He he should play wide receiver. No, he shouldn't. No, he you know, shouldn't. you know, all those types of things. The guy, that guy in this class might be Carson Strong. <clears throat> I think so. And what's been interesting about the NFL wide events of the past 72 hours, it does seem like the NFL looks at this quarterback class and is thinking they're a year away. They're, they're a year away from being, a, being ready. When you have Washington give up what they gave up to get Carson Wentz, it's clear that a team that was picking 11th overall, 
they could theoretically have had their pick of any of these guys in this class decided we're going to give Carson once a year, you know? Yeah. And so I think interestingly enough, we might get the set of circumstances and you and I have sometimes talked about where these guys get a year. Yeah. These guys get to land in spots where they'll have opportunities to sit, learn, develop, and get that red shirt type of season. And, and in Strawn's case, it might be a medical red shirt type of season because Washington, maybe they won't draft him at 11. But I don't think I'd rule out them drafting a quarterback because they might take the opportunity once gives us a year. He's probably going to be good enough that we're not picking top 10 next year. We might be picking in the 20s. We can draft a guy a year ahead of schedule. So when they're on the clock at, say, 47, and Carson Strong's staring them in the face, there's your medical redshirt year for him. Yeah. Or Tampa Bay at 60, or any of these other teams. I mean, Tennessee, you know, they don't have a second-round pick, but, you know, if they package something to get into the second round, or even if they wait until the third and, and move up a little bit for, for Strong, there's your medical redshirt type of year. Another good landing spot for him, perhaps. They got to pick a 43 Atlanta. Yeah. You got Matt Ryan for one more year and you let Carson Strong learn under Matt Ryan and then 2023, let it rip with him. Um, I, I think these quarterbacks might benefit from what the NFL sees in them. Yeah. And we Let's might. Hope so. Yeah. Let's you know, hope. because I think you and I are of a shared mind with these guys. I don't know if I'm running them any, any of them out there next season. Uh, no, I, I don't want to. But yeah. I think that I think that's a recipe for disaster for most of them. Um, you know, even if say Malik Willis lands in Pittsburgh, where I think that could be a nice fit for him if they maintain a short, uh, a similar offense to what Roethlisberger did, but add some more you know design quarterback runs to it. Yeah, that could be a nice fit for 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 Malik Willis. But I think a lot of these fits could be good for the quarterback temporarily, but bad for the team long term. If they don't, yeah. if they don't give him a chance to develop in that first year, and yeah, I Carson Strong reminds me of that that Chad Kelly kind of like give him a year, get his body right, right, and then see what he has. The difference is is that we don't, I don't think we have any um, barroom incidents with uh, Carson Strong. So don't think we do. No, you know, less mo, lot less mobility. But uh, you know, but the but the pocket, but the pocket feel, the pocket presence, the leverage reading, the, the you know the leadership on the field, obviously off the field. Yeah. You know, it's all there for him, man. I'm I'm kind yeah. of ex I'm low key excited about Carson Strong. I am too. I mean, and I was a bit more reserved on him. I will say, you know, you try not to overreact to stuff in Indianapolis, but. I was very impressed with his, his podium session and it answered some questions that I had, you know, not just the stuff at the line of scrimmage, but obviously the knee injury, like to hear him describe it the way he did to hear him say, look, I wanted to play to hear him when he said, my dad didn't want me to play, but I still did like that. That hit me in a way beyond being an analyst as it hit me as a dad, yeah. you know? And, and, you know, there, there was something, sort of powerful about that and so you know i'm trying not to wildly overreact to that but it was impressive in my mind yeah and i think that that's the thing is that if you know overall i can't emphasize this enough your your big box draft analysts your three letter and four letter word.com draft analysts are are going to are not going to be as high or positive on carson strong because they're they're looking at it from what makes a first round pick, what makes a second round pick, what makes a third round pick. That's that alters. That's not a pure talent grade. You're not a pure talent evaluator when you're doing that. And I understand that they'll say, well, all these things go into it. Yes, I do. I understand that you are, you are playing the draft game, right? We are not playing the draft game here at the RSP Film Room. We are playing talent, talent, and who, traits, and yeah, talent and traits. I don't, you know, th that other stuff is the reality, and it's an important reality. But if you're if you're gonna bet on talent, 
And you're going to also say, I'm not, I'm also not going, I'm going to reject some of the, the circus and dog and pony show stuff that goes on with the draft, which is entertaining and gets a lot of great narratives, but I'm going to ignore all that stuff. And I'm going to bet on talent riding it out. As long as his medicals are like, he'll be good in a year and his yeah. prognosis should be fine. Then he's, he belongs in this conversation. If the medicals, if we find out from the medicals either after the draft or before the draft, that it's like we're looking at at any moment that knee just basically is going to blow up and it's Joe, you know, it's Jay Ajayi, you know, yeah. basically type of thing. Then, yeah, then you yeah. have to downgrade them and say, you know, we're, we can't count on much. But this was probably, this was a, a fun show just to get a chance to learn Mark's insights from talking with him. Obviously, his film insights, which are always invaluable. And, you know, you can find Mark at TD Wire. You can find him at a, just about every podcast that is figuring out how to discover him and the work that he does. And yes, on Twitter, at Mark Schofield, you can find him there too. I'm Matt Waldman. You know where you can find me. You know where you can go find Go buy the RSP. Me. Yeah, go get the RSP. I am writing up the running back chapters, um, chapter this week. And hopefully getting it done by Sunday. Um, and then we'll be doing a running back related show. Um, you know, probably do a solo cast on that. And then Mark and I will reconvene. Probably we will do a, I don't know who we're going to do next week. Probably Malik Willis. Um, maybe one other guy. You know, it depends on, on, on what we decide off the air here. But thanks yep. again. And Go check out John Hodgins GoFundMe. Go check it's, it out. Yeah, it's in the and, details. And, and of, share it. If, if you can't donate, please share it. And, yeah. you know, let's try to help John out. Yeah, I'll share it on Twitter um, so that you can share that as well. You can share it on all your other favorite social media platforms. Thanks again, guys, and have a good week.